One of Ajahn Suat's favorite teachings was the point that there are many things the Buddha said are not self. Form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness. These are all not self. But then the Buddha has us reflect. We are the owners of our actions. Karma is not not self. What we do is our responsibility. What we do is our refuge. Given the situation now, it's good to re remember what really is ours, what's not ours. Because so many things that we hold on to, the more we hold on, the more they slip through our fingers. And as they slip through their fingers, they cut them. The Buddha's image is of being washed down a river. And you see there are grasses on the bank of the river. So you try to hold on. Either the grasses get pulled out, uprooted, you get swept away, or they cut through your hands as you try to hold on to them. So many things in life are like that. So what can we rely on? If our intentions are good, we can rely on our intentions. This is one of the reasons why we meditate, is to strengthen the mind's ability to create good intentions, to abandon unskillful ones. And then once we've created skillful intentions, to maintain them. So we get a better and better idea of what skillful means. This is our refuge. This is what we can depend on. Someone once asked a monk, what are the results of action? And he said, pain, stress. And they said, well, I've never heard that from any Buddhist monk before. So the monk went back to see Ananda. Ananda took him to see the Buddha. And the Buddha said, that's not how you answer that question. Another monk happened to be listening in. So well, maybe he's thinking about the fact that all feelings are stressful. And karma leads to feelings. So therefore, all karma leads to stress and pain. The Buddha said, that's not how you answer that. When you talk about karma, you're talking about the three kinds of feelings. Because you have the choice of acting. And you want to know which kind of feeling are you going to be producing. Because pleasure is preferable to pain. And who's going to be experiencing the pleasure? Either you in this lifetime, or you in a subsequent lifetime. And the question to what extent that other person will be you. The Buddha leaves up in the air. Even the extent to which you are the same person in one lifetime. That's debatable. But there's a sense of me, and it keeps feeding. There's a continuity there. You look at your body now. It's your body. It's very different from what was your body before. But this is the body you have available to you, so this is the one you hold on to. In a future lifetime, the body will change very much. You'll go from this body to another body based on your craving. And the options open to you will be dependent on your actions. And that will be your body again. The mind is like a hermit crab. The consciousness that goes from moment to moment to moment always has a sense of me, as long as it's unawakened. And wherever it finds itself, whatever it latches onto, will also be me, mine. The same way that a hermit crab goes from one shell to another. It doesn't have a shell of its own. So it finds an empty shell and moves in. If that shell gets destroyed, it searches around, finds another empty shell and moves into that. In each case, it's its shell. It protects it as long as it's able to. When it can't protect it anymore, it goes looking for a new one. Well, that's how the consciousness we have here, from moment to moment, this process of consciousness moves on, always latching onto this as me, this is mine. So as long as there's going to be clinging there, you try to give it something good to cling to. 
This way you provide for yourself now and on into the future. So even though things are falling apart outside, make sure they don't fall apart inside. Remember, you do have something you can hold on to. You can make the self its own mainstay. John Lee talks about this a lot. He says, we take refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, but then again the Buddha says the self is its own mainstay. How do you put those together? Well, you try to develop the qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha inside you, and then you can depend on yourself. The Buddha gives a long list. I can't remember all ten factors in the list. One of the more interesting ones is the extent to which you are helpful to others. That is also your mainstay. You develop good qualities inside and you share them outside. You develop the skills that are helpful to the life of the group. Because after all, even though we are our own mainstays, we do have to depend on one another for all that we're protecting ourselves and isolating ourselves. The virus is bound to come. If the virus doesn't come, other diseases will come. I was talking today to a number of people who themselves or their relatives have other diseases, which could be fatal, but they can't have them treated now because the virus has taken over the hospital. So whichever way, we're going to depend on one another. And one way to make sure that other people will be happy to help you is that you help them. You keep them in mind. This is why I keep saying, at the end of the day, when you've done what you have to do, don't just think about what you want to do now. Ask yourself to have a little energy to do at least something for someone else's well-being. Make that a habit. That kind of habit then becomes something you can depend on. And even though we face a lot of loss, the potential for illness, death even, we have to remember there are certain things that are in our control. The body's not in our control. It is to some extent. But there are a lot of things you can't tell. It You can't say, may you be the kind of body that remains asymptomatic when the virus comes. May you become the kind of body that has resistance. You can't tell the body that. You can try to create the conditions as best you can, but there's something that is beyond your control. But there are some things you can control. You can exert some control over what you do and you say and you think. This is one of the reasons why we meditate, is to gain some control. Because where do our actions come from? They come from our intentions. Where are you going to see your intentions in action so you can straighten them out? Well, while you're meditating. It's just the simple act of Noticing when the mind has wandered off and you bring it back. The simple act of noticing, how can I breathe in a way that gives my mind a sense of comfort so it wants to stay here? All of these help bring you in more control of the mind. The area where you are responsible and the area where you can be in charge. There's nobody in charge outside, but you can be in charge in your mind. And that's where you can find your refuge. So do your best to make this refuge strong. Because otherwise you'll have nothing to hold on to.